Spoonbills and flamingos have bills that are similar to ducks. Uh, <clears throat> however, their shape is kind of uh, a weird. Uh, and if you look at a flamingo with its mouth closed, its beak closed, it doesn't look particularly weird. When it has it open, suddenly it locks, looks pretty strange. But you can see the serrations on here, um, similar to what we saw in the merganser. And uh, a... Uh, famous picture of a flamingo turned upside down sort of points out this idea uh, that the beak is actually inverted. It's almost shaped in an upside down way. Uh, this is the actual image of the bird with its feet. You see it without its feet. It looks normal, almost. With its feet, suddenly you realize you're looking at an upside down picture. All right, uh, raptors, owls, hawks, eagles have short bills that have a hooked tip that's ideal for dismembering prey. So they go in and tear out chunks of meat with that beak. Toucans and hornbills are both fruit specialists. Their light, long bills allow them to pluck distant fruit so they can reach out to branches adjacent and uh, pull fruit down. Uh, very pretty and strangely long beaks. Uh, toucan tongue. Uh, that is the tongue of a toucan extended out of the middle of that picture. Kind of strange looking. They have a very weird looking tongue. Skimming birds have compressed lower mandible that snaps shut down when they hit a fish. So they kind of drag through the water till they hit something and then slap their beak shut and take off with their food. The bird flies through the water, mandible skimming through the water. All right, so let's talk about avian lungs, bird lungs. If you fly, the demands of getting oxygen in to process energy so that you can keep flying means you have to be doing a lot of work. Your lung has to be much more efficient than the mammalian lung. Uh, we are pretty good at not having to do a whole lot of breathing to do what we do. When we start exercising, suddenly you notice your breath rate goes up, your heart rate goes up. Well, birds have to be doing this all the time if they're flying all the time. Air is a one-way flow. Uh, that means it's more efficient. They don't have the time like we do where we inhale and now I've got air sitting in my lungs that's not being used and then I exhale. With birds, they have a single passage or a single pathway that air flows through. Air goes in, gets used, and comes back out through a separate pathway. They have a two breath cycle that they use, and they have what are called air sacs, little pockets of air that they store inside their body. So kind of give you an idea of how this looks. This is the trachea, this is where they're breathing in. Air gets pulled in, it goes to the posterior air sacs. Notice it hasn't gone to the lungs yet. Then when they uh, breathe out, expiration cycle one, they're actually pushing the air from the posterior air sacs over their lungs. Then when they uh, breathe in, inspiration cycle two, that same air now goes to the anterior air sacs, the front of the body. And then when they exhale again, that anterior air sac empties and they get rid of the air. So they are constantly moving air. While this is happening, air is going to this posterior air sac. That's the same time that this is happening when the air that was in the lungs is going to the anterior air sac. So these two things are happening at the same time, these two things are happening at the same time, but the air moves from air sac to lungs to air sac to the out of the body. The air sacs don't look so mechanical like they do in this picture. They look a little bit more like this. So they just have little pockets they can store air in throughout the body. Birds have a four-chambered heart. Again, I mentioned that crocodilians have that. Mammals do that as well. It's a very efficient cardiovascular system that permits them to meet the demands of flight. Uh, not only delivers oxygen to body cells, but also maintains temperature. A lot of our body temperature is maintained by pumping warm blood from the core of our body to the extremities of the body. Feeding and digestion. Birds lack teeth, so they can't process food much in their mouth, so they leave that up to their gastric system, their uh, digestive system. Birds can frequently gather food faster than they can process it, so they'll have a crop. We saw this way back in annelids. They have a storage area for excess food. 
just an enlarged part of the esophagus where that extra excess food waits till it can be digested. Uh, the crop, has, crop is also used to store food that can be regurgitated to chicks. So when a bird goes out to feed its baby chicks, it gathers up a bunch of food, stores it in the crop, coughs it back up, and then feeds them. Here is the digestive tract. You can see this is the mouth uh, and where the food goes, there's this crop before it goes to the stomach for digestion. Then afterwards is the in intestine. Their gizzard is a, a part of the stomach where it is ground up, then the intestine for digestion and eventually leaving at the cloaca. The bird's stomach is dictated by its diet. If they eat soft foods, uh, they will have uh, like meat uh, they have extensible stomachs that can hold a lot of food. So they can pull in and have a large volume of food. If they have to process tough foods, uh, some plant materials, seeds and insects, it takes a much more grinding to get that food into a state they can digest it. Uh, they will have a more muscular stomach to do that. The stomach has two parts, the anterior glandular proventriculus and the posterior gizzard. The proventriculus is where the digestive enzymes come from. Uh, birds that swallow whole foods like fruits, uh, it will go into the pro. Uh, well, it'll go into the stomach, and the proventriculus will be very large because they have to produce a lot of digestive enzymes to break down uh, that fruit. The gizzard is kind of like the teeth in mammals. They don't have teeth. Birds do not have teeth. So the gizzard is to mechanically grind up the food. The walls of the gizzard are thick, muscular. The gizzard often contains small stones which the bird swallows to assist in grinding the food. Those are called gastroliths. We see those in uh, a lot of reptiles. We see those in dinosaur remains. Uh, dinosaur feces that's preserved, that's called a coprolite, uh, will actually sometimes have uh, fossilized gastroliths inside of it. Intestines, the main site of chemical digestion is the intestine, where enzymes break down the food into small molecules absorbed in the intestinal wall. That's pretty similar to what we do. Seasonal changes. This is kind of an interesting one. Birds change their diet throughout the year. So if they eat insects in the beginning of spring, they quickly digest those and then berries that are growing in the beginning of spring. And then later on, some birds will switch to eating more and more plant material in the fall as uh, fruits grow and develop. Uh, so their intestines will change. It can grow by 20% and decrease by 20% when they switch back to eating animal prey again, eating larvae or whatnot. Accompanying the morphological changes are changes in the types and quantities of digestive enzymes. So the proventriculus will actually change to match the diet of what they're eating. If they're eating more plant material, they produce more digestive enzymes. Sensory system. Most birds have excellent vision. We saw this transition to reliance on uh, vision in the reptiles because they're moving to land, becomes much more important. Uh, this changes the structure of the brain. M birds tend to have large optic lobes and the midbrain, which processes visual information, is also enlarged. That's a Puerto Rican screech owl. Bird eyes are similar in structure to those of other vertebrates, but the shape varies from flattened to tube-like. Kind of strange. Variation in shape appears to be the result of difficulties of fitting an enlarged eye into the modest skull size. Birds' skulls happen to be kind of small. Even uh, looking at an owl, the skull uh, takes up a remarkably small part of what you think of as the owl's head because most of it's covered in big tufts of feathers. By altering eye shape, birds such as owls have avoided developing disproportionately large heads that would be required if their eyes were spherical. We have spherical eyes, and we have to have a larger head to support that. If birds did that, they'd either have eyes popping out of their skulls or something else, so they, they have adapted to a smaller skull size. A unique feature of the avian eye is the presence of a comb-like structure called the pecten. Uh, you can see this picture, this little uh, yellowish comb-looking structure in here. It arises near the rear of the eye, close to where the optic nerve exits the eye, so the nerve runs through the back of the eye and goes to the brain. The function of the pectin remains unclear after 200 years of investigation. It gets a large supply of blood. There's a lot of blood flowing into the pectin. Uh, maybe it provides nutrition to the retina. Maybe it removes metabolic wastes from the, the fluid in your eye, which is called vitreous humor. 
We don't know. Uh, so kind of an interesting that there are a lot of these areas where we'll talk about stuff and we have best explanations, but we, we really just don't know the, all the answers yet. Second interesting feature of ABNIs is the presence of colored oil droplets in their cone cells. So we have rods and cones. Rods are good at picking up light uh, just in general. Is there light or is there not? When it's late at night and you have barely any light in your house, everything looks kind of black and white or kind of uh, sepia colors, kind of brownish yellow. But you don't see a lot of bright colors when the lights are very dim. That's because your body is, your eyes are using rods to process that light. They're good at picking up low amounts of light. We also have cones and the cones pick up color, but they only work when there's a lot of light. So you don't see color when it's close to dark. So avian eyes in their cone cells have an oil droplet that's in the eye. Uh, acts as a filter absorbing wavelengths of light allowing others through. That's our best guess. We don't know why they have this little dobble of oil in each of their cone cells. Kind of strange. Hearing. Birds have hearing that's comparable to humans, uh, even though they have smaller heads. But they have proportionally larger and more sensitive tympanic membranes. Uh, their cochlea, that's the inner ear, has 10 times as many hair cells per unit length as a mammalian cochlea. That's the structure that's in the inside of your inner ear. Uh, it looks kind of like a shell of a snail, kind of spirals around. There's fluid in there, little hairs inside of it. And every time you shift your head around, those hairs move around, and that's what helps you maintain your balance. If you've ever done the game where you put a bat on your forehead, you spin around in a circle and try to run in a straight line, you are spinning the fluid in your cochlea, and it doesn't stop moving. It keeps spinning around even though you stop spinning. So when you try to run in a straight line, you end up being a little dizzy. They have more dense hair cells in their cochlea than we do. Why is that? Well, they're flying around. They're moving in a three-dimensional space, and they have to maintain balance in that three-dimensional environment. And to do that, they have many more cells that provide balance. Owls possess the most acute hearing among the birds. I mentioned this before, the rough of feathers around the face actually acts as a funnel to pull sound into their ears. Uh, it amplifies it and kind of draws it into their ears. Some ruffs are asymmetrical, and the ruffs asymmetry enhances the owl's ability to isolate sounds in three-dimensional space. Some owls will have one ear higher than the other. Can't see it, it's underneath the feathers. The skull is a little structure in here, but their ears are either high or low, and that uh, will change where the sound goes to, which allows them to pinpoint things by sound. Olfaction, smell. Most birds have a poorly developed sense of smell. A few groups have a good sense of smell. So what you could say is there are a few groups that birds that smell good. <clears throat> the kiwis, which have nostrils at the end of their bill, use odor cues to find prey when they probe the earth. This is a kiwi. They kind of root around with their bill and they can smell from the end of the bill. All right, so a quick quiz. Uh, where does this bird live, the one whose feet are represented on the left? She said water, probably correct, because look at those long waiting legs. What does it eat? It's waiting in the water, it probably eats fish. How about this bird, where does it live? If you said on the surface of the water, because it uses these feet as paddles, good guess, what does it eat? Probably hunting around at the surface of the water uh, for prey. How about this bird? If you said that this is a raptorial predator, you're probably correct. This looks like a hunting bird. Wicked sharp talons, good grasping legs. And that is it for birds. Thank you very much, and next time we get to talk about mammals.